Uh, you want to uh, see a quick trick before we start? That would be awesome. I'd love to. Let's let's do this real quick. Um, I have a deck of playing cards here, and I'm gonna have I'm gonna sign one of the cards. Um, so that way we know that there's no other card like that in the world. Okay. Okay. So uh, I don't, there's no duplicates, right? So uh, go, go ahead and give me a symbol or something that I can write on here so that you know that uh, it, that's the only card that you have. Okay. How about I for inspired and then a dollar sign for money? Actually, I was able to fit the whole thing in there. <laughs> All right. Okay. So the card goes into the deck like that. You can, can you, I'll, I'll wait for you. White balance is off. That's sleight of hand. You probably can see that it jumps to the top. I'll do that again. This time we'll do it face up, okay? Which podcast did you listen to? Or do you, do you remember which one you listened to? I do not remember. I can go look it up if you want. Um, no, it's okay. It's a little bit new, so right here. It wasn't a video, right? You didn't watch a video cast? No, it was audio only. That's got to be James the Juggler. Yes, that is. That's something fun that we've been doing. I've that is cool. Box. I like the floating head effect. What? I like James's floating head effect. <laughs> yeah. So he, he's, he's definitely helping out with some of the shows. So. From making it to giving it away, inspired money means making a difference, creating something bigger than oneself, and maybe, just maybe, making the world a better place. Thank you for joining me. Hey, Inspired Moneymaker. Welcome back. If this is your first time joining us, welcome. Do you like magic? I don't know about you, but I grew up watching David Copperfield and Doug Henning. Maybe you like David Blaine and Chris Angel. I got to see Doug Henning perform back in the 1980s. My interest in magic is summed up well by this Doug Henning quote, the art of the magician is to create wonder. If we live with a sense of wonder, our lives become filled with joy. Today we're talking with master magician Dan Chan. He's performed everywhere from kids' birthday parties to corporate events for tech billionaires and Silicon Valley elite. Like many things, I think magic can be a metaphor for life or business. So Dan's experiences can apply to things that you do, even if you don't know any magic tricks. In this episode, you'll learn pivoting a live magic show to a virtual experience on Zoom, why walkaway power is important in negotiating, and then make sure you listen to the end to hear Dan's unique stock buying strategy. He invests in every company that hires him. Now let's get inspired with Dan Chan. Dan, welcome to Inspired Money. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Andy, thank you for having me. Let's jump right in. What's your earliest childhood memory of money? Yeah, uh, I remember some shoes that I wanted. And um, I remember my mom, I, th I think we made a deal with my mom uh, where I kept the money instead of getting the shoes. <laughs> so like, uh, it was just delayed gratification. Uh, I, I remember really wanting shoes because back in the day, those Reebok pumps were the thing. I'm 42 years old. So Nikes and Reeboks were the things that everyone had. And that's, the, that was the status symbol. Yes, I remember having those Reebok pump shoes. There was there was that period where everything had air in it, from tennis rackets to Air Jordans to <laughs> like whatever it was. There was like a clear window or air. Yeah, I think they should bring those back because they had that basketball up front and you'd pump it and it was just the coolest thing. And I'm sure kids would love that right now. 
Yes, yeah. with, with fashion, it comes in cycles. So those should be coming back soon. So Dan, I'm so excited to talk to you. You're a professional magician today. You're definitely chasing your passion. Take us back almost 20 years ago. How did magic start as your side hustle? I didn't know that you could go to a magic shop and buy things. But even more important than that was going to the magic shop and going to lectures. You would just plop down your money and you can actually learn how the tricks work. And you might pay 30 or $40 but they would reveal the secrets. So these guys were good magicians. Some of them were like semi pros, but they weren't of the level that I would say are really good because at that level, you don't have to sell your secrets for money. But there's always a creative mind behind the stars. Like Copperfield has Chris Kenner and Jim Steinmeier or all these industry guys that they have their brain trust or masterminds. So once I realized that magic principles can translate from one thing to another and something very simple just changed a little bit can fool really intelligent audiences so that's my progression as i i saw a guy his name was Jero joseph i was volunteering to make balloon sculpting at my um cousin's husband's sister's kid's birthday party and she tipped me 10 bucks and I was like ecstatic. I asked the guy who was there and I started talking to him. He told me he was making $250 a pop for kids' birthday parties. I'm like, I can do everything you could do probably. So from there, I just reverse engineered it. I said, if I could do four of those in a week, I would have $1,000 a week. Then it would become $52,000 a year. If I could double that, I would have 100,000 a year. Did you like performing as a kid? Any clues? in your youth that you would be doing what you're doing today? Not really. I would be the guy heckling the magician. I think I was the loudmouth kid. Um, I came from a divorced family, so I always had to stick up for myself and I was bullied a lot. So I kind of fought back and I kind of stuck out too because I didn't have the social skills. So I would work out. I, I was the buffest kid in the class, but I would just have a deck of playing cards in my hand and I would do these things like what you're seeing here, the one-handed shuffles and the one-handed cuts. But I would have this in my hand while the teacher was doing things. I'd have him in the cafeteria and we would play poker and we'd try to pretend to cheat each other and do all these things. But I didn't have any indication. I had some magic books and I would spend my extra money on magic books, but not often. Maybe like twice a year, I would maybe go to a library and, a library and pick up a book or see a book and I would, I would just have this really small collection of magic books. I remember going to a magic shop when I was a little kid and I had seen this trick on TV performed on That's Incredible or one of those shows where the magician takes a quarter and then forces a cigarette through it. And I remember seeing that in the uh, like glass case of a magic shop and I really, really wanted to buy it, but it was 40 bucks. So to like a seven year old, 40 bucks was like, holy cow, I can't afford that. But I always had the desire to, to learn that trick. Yeah, it, it's a great trick. And I think that those are the gate, gatekeepers. You have to pay a price to get in the game, whether it's paying for coaching or paying for props. I have an insane amount of things that I have around me. I, I typically go no gimmicks, no gadgets. That's like what I like. But in the beginning, the first 10 years was like James Bond. I had to have every little toy and trick uh, to know how everything works. But I thought to myself, if someone figures it out, would they appreciate the skill behind it? Or would they appreciate the story? So it became more important that even if the smartest person figured it out, they would still be able to give me props. 99% of the stuff I do, no one ever fig figures out. There's like the 1% hobbyist who's like a CEO who also happens to know magic. They sometimes figure something out, but you can't, you can't really stop that. I have a, a friend who's founded a company and he is way into magic. He's been to as many magic lectures as I have during this um, lockdown. And he knows so much. <laughs> So yeah, guys like that, it's a lot harder to fool. So magician CEO is a very narrow niche. I know that you were working at pre-IPO PayPal when Peter Thiel and Elon Musk were there. Initially, that job was a dream job for you. 
how is it that you like tell us about how you went from that job to saying i want to be a magician full time like doing five parties over the weekend isn't enough you can do more yeah here's the thing i was always turning things down and if the event was big enough, I would actually take my sick days or say I'm going to a doctor, believe it or not. I, like if events were close enough in Palo Alto, I would just say, I'm going to the doctor. I'll be back later and I'll work a little bit later. And they were okay with it. But that kind of became kind of taxing. I was in customer service. Then I went into finance because my background at UC Riverside was finance. So I knew PayPal was a hot thing and IPOs were a hot thing. So they gave me stock options with a one year um, cliff and then you'd have to vest over four years. I was there exactly 13 months. And then when they laid people off, I was happy. I was the only one. I, I remember people going into HR, coming out crying. When I went into HR, I knew the writing was on the wall. And I was so happy because I think they gave me two months severance or something. And I wanted to quit. I kept on telling my mom, I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. And she's like, no, you're not going to quit. So when they kind of told us, oh, things are going to get changed around. And I, I remember some conversations about like getting retrained or things like that. But I was, I didn't take initiative. I probably should have because I probably should have on hindsight, I should have like two or four X my performance fee, instead of charging $200, I should have charged 500 or $1,000 and turned down all the smaller events and only caught in sick once a month. If I were to replay it, I think I should have stayed at PayPal because I looked at the stock options. If I knew everything on hindsight and knew when to sell, I would have been closer to a millionaire. <laughs> I would have been a lot closer, so. I know, hindsight's 2020. It's always hard looking back and knowing what has happened to PayPal since then, that is worth a lot of gigs, <laughs> the value of the stock options. Yeah. <laughs> so any regrets there? Or were you happy shifting from a job that you didn't like to doing something that you really had a passion for? I don't know. I, I, I think that if I, worked harder or I uh, networked with people more, I would have maybe even moved on to uh, like Yelp or YouTube or some of the other companies guys um, founded. Uh, Max moved on to, I think, Slide and a, a lot of other companies. And it's interesting where everyone from the PayPal mafia were. And I was in that, you know, I was alongside with them, but I didn't develop those relationships with people. And I wish I did that a lot stronger. Um, but when you're 20, I think 20, 21, you don't, you're, you're very narrow minded. You're thinking, I, I was thinking just playing video games as, you know, when there was a spare moment, I didn't think ahead. And I, I really didn't put in the hard work. Once I started working for myself, I put in a lot more hard work because I was so passionate about what I was doing. So it's, you never know what, what things are going to happen. So you got to make the best of it. But instead now I've performed for all these companies and more like I've worked for Apple five, six times, Google 25 times, um, every single major company you can name on my uh, website. I've done that. There's only three on my list that I have not done yet. I haven't done Tesla. I don't think I've done Uber and I didn't do SpaceX and I checked everything off from A to Z. Uh, SpaceX called me to do an event in Southern California because I already had a potential event on that date. I quoted way too high. When I look at CNN later, I found out that there was a space launch. I look back on my calendar and I'm like, crap, I think I was supposed to do that event because that's the same date inquiry that they asked me to go to LA, Hawthorne, California. And I'm like, oh man. I think that was my biggest regret because I was at that time I was riding really high and I had a lot of walk away power, but it would have been nice to see that uh, space shuttle launch. Well, the good news is that SpaceX continues to re do really cool things. So you've still got a chance. <laughs> Elon's not uh, answering any of my emails or messages. Uh, <laughs> I've, I, I, I've thrown some things out his way. So not yet, not yet. Just be patient. So. Yeah. 
I would guess that the math was pretty easy in those early days. As you said, it's like you could do five parties over the weekend and at $200, $250 per party, you were, you were like reaching a point where you could make more doing those weekend jobs than your full-time job. And yeah. your full-time job was at a startup. So you had long hours. It wasn't like a nine to five where you go home and have a lot of free time. You were working like seven days a week for 60 hours or something. Yeah, you you aren't able to you aren't able to really focus in or cut custom tailor the events or script. And that's really when you're an artist, you have to put yourself all in. I feel if you want to be successful or to achieve a level of success beyond what everyone else is doing, I am scripting. I'm doing so much right now that you won't believe but that's the reason why people are now paying me 500 to 2500 in general and i've gotten 5000 for shows but those are rare occasions but my range is from that 500 to 2500 and most people are struggling in this entertainment agent industry but i've been able to do really well and i credit it to spending you know 8 to 12 hours a day minimum on my work and my craft when you decided to go full time, did you have much debt? Did you have family? Like, what was that transition like as far as what your expenses were at that time? How much pressure was there to do more gigs and support yourself uh, as a full time entrepreneur? Yeah, fortunately, I didn't meet my wife until a lot later and I wasn't dating too much. You know, it was pretty casual. So, I lived at home probably in, uh, until my uh, later 20s, uh, definitely until like 27, 28. But I stayed at home a lot. So I had this big runway and I saved up a lot of money. I would travel to magic conventions every year and I would hang out with the greats of magic. David Copperfield, um, Chris Angel, David Blaine, Cyril Takayama. I would see them and I would hang out with all their consultants. So being around greatness and the guys who made them great made me realize, hey, I can get there. I have that chance. I'm hanging out with them. And that's when I started really figuring out the soft skills because you'd have to eat, drink, and hang out with them and just chill like one of the guys so you can get into that inner circle. And that's what I do with a lot of my clients now. Um, I don't just entertain them. I entertain them, but afterwards, they invite me to chill with them and hang out, and they introduce me like a friend. And that's why being a renaissance person is more important than knowing a magic trick because there's so many guys who know a trick but then they don't know how to fit in or they don't know how to dress so people don't want to hire that guy it's like they're still that geeky magic kid which i was many many years ago but now i can talk about so many other things besides magic uh like your clients will see you elsewhere skiing or they'll see me at like um a really nice restaurant. I, I've seen some of my billionaire clients out on the street and we can talk. I think that there is a tendency for the magician, kind of like a musician who is locked in their room practicing all the time and you're not putting yourself out there because it requires that uh, solitary time to really get good at your craft. I heard you once say that magic is about making connections. So it's not even, I mean, of course you have to do the tricks, but in your show, you have to be engaging and connect with the audience. Absolutely. Connection is more important because they'll forgive you. In the beginning, you learn all these slights and that's kind of like to get your street cred. But if you're really smart about magic and you know how to craft a show, you don't even need that sleight of hand. It's great because it's visual, but it's actually not necessary. In, in fact, I worked a lot harder in the beginning, but now I hide more of my skills. Sometimes like when I meet a CEO and their kids, I might show them off, show off some card flourishes or what we call XCM, which is extreme card manipulation. But more so, I work less, I get paid a lot more. Before I was juggling three flaming torches, five balls, picking pockets. Those were my skill sets. Those were my differentiators. Now my differentiator is reputation and also being on the media. 
Um, people can look back on television, the BuzzFeed article that ran on me, Hustle Magazine, uh, and Business Insider. And Business Insider recently did a full profile feature on me. So those media mentions are just as effective as the sleight of hand skill. And I was, I, I still am one, probably one of the best sleight of hand artists, but going beyond that is really what's the differentiator. Now. So tell us how you came to those realizations that reputation and doing some PR are really important for your business, maybe within the context of how your business progressed from doing those children's parties in the early days to rebranding yourself to higher ticket gigs at corporate events. Yeah, a lot of people said, Dan, you're really skilled. Um, however, people don't pay you for your skill. And I, I, I didn't believe that. I just, I, I didn't believe what they were saying. But then they started showing me that they were making way more than I was and doing way less. And I started asking myself, what are they doing? So I started asking them questions and picking their brains and paying them for their advice. It's funny, like, I, I wish I paid my mentors earlier than later because I paid so much for college, a four-year college degree. Yet I was so cheap when someone said, hey, I want a thousand bucks for coaching. I said no to that or I waited until a lot longer because you spend 50 or $100,000 for schooling and you expect to go on this field. Now I was already 100% committed to being in magic, yet I wasn't willing to pay someone who already achieved the results that I achieved. So to me now, if someone tells me about something, like just recently someone told me about their book and it's a $100 book and it was talking about business and magic. Instantly when he PM'd that to me, I immediately bought his book. If he wanted to sell me coaching, I would probably buy it too. Not because I'm an easy sell, it's because I followed his career online and I knew the success he had. When I bought the book, he immediately opened up. He asked me for a lot of questions. I even helped him with his show. Then later on, he threw in another book that he wrote previously as a thank you. But if I didn't buy his initial book, that door wouldn't have been open but he knew I was one to take action. But in the beginning, I started seeing this and I, it's amazing when young people ask questions, I always tell them, invest in yourself, especially if they wanna get into this field. They should, and work really hard. Like I see people not willing to, for me in the beginning, I would take almost any event. If it, I was usually asking 250, but if someone said to me, oh, I only have 200, I'd still take that. It's, you have to get that market share, kind of like what Bill Gates has in his bios. Just grab that market share and then use that cash for other things. I have magician friends say, I only do this. So then they're inflexible. So when I see them at a, a magic auction or something, or I see them buying stuff, they complain and they bitch and whine about not having something. When if you just did one extra event, you would have that Thing that you could buy <laughs> so it's it's all about hard work and really hustling especially in the beginning when you when you're doing entertainment you have to have enough walk away power now if i turn one thing down i i'm prepping for being on television on tuesday i'm prepping for writing something for the whole magic community right now with something that people can buy so now i have enough walk away power and that's the biggest thing about negotiation is knowing when to walk away and when not to walk away and when to do those free gigs. A lot of people say, oh, don't do free gigs. If someone says to me, hey, I want you to do a free gig, I'll ask who's there and how they're gonna feature me. Sometimes I've been on like the headliner and the pub amount of publicity that I've gotten like to do these really worthy nonprofits like for um, Samaritan House or some other ones, but they treat you like a superstar when you do that. And sometimes you might discount an event for these nonprofits, but it, it's never, you have to know what the rules are and you have to know when you can break those rules. Dan, in your experience, how much of your career can you sort of plot out and strategize ahead of time? Like I want to do parties and then I'm going to sharpen my saw and get really good. 
and now I'm going to get corporate gigs. How much of it is that? How much of it is pre-planning versus talking to a mentor who may have suggested to you, you've got to do more corporate gigs because you can charge more? Or is it just sort of, sort of serendipitous where you're willing to take some free gigs and you're not really sure where that's going to lead, but you're kind of open to opportunities and things just happen? It's a combination of both. Like for me, when I first started, I had to go places. Now, when I planned out my kid's career, my son can juggle five balls, three flaming torches and picks pockets. His name is James. And uh, for on stage, he's James the juggler. I planned all this out before he was born. I knew specifically what I was gonna teach him. And I taught other people so it'd be a lot easier and smoother. So he's like a prodigy. He can hold his own 40 minute show and do really well. When people are looking at it, they're like surprised. I just said, no, I'm not, for family, you're not gonna hold anything back. So I just thought, what's the most direct part? So for me, I'm his mentor. I can get him there. For other people, for me, I just went around and I asked the people who are successful, but I was really, really respectful when I asked them. People who are way wealthier than me, um, I would take them out to lunch or dinner and I'd make it a nice lunch or dinner and that would leave them an impression. They're like, oh, this kid definitely doesn't have the money, but he's willing to do this. That's respect. And they want to take them. And when I tell people about magic, ask people who are about to retire because they're going to be a lot more open with their secrets. They want to pass things on. That there's certain time that you want to do things and it's a timing thing there's some people who will be like an open book and they're very sharing like um my friend warren and warren and annabelle's in hawaii i was a nobody but when i walked up to him i t uh, you know he didn't have to do anything but he was one of the nicest guys to me in magic i sent him an email and he did he was so nice i won't mention what he did but he he really went above and beyond for a kid who had nothing to give back there are kind of jokes about the Bay Area. Everybody is either a VC or like a tech startup. You're obviously encouraging your kids into show business. Is show business a good business? Is magic a good business? If you have a competitive advantage and you, you have a long-term thinking, I think it, it can be very good. Um, I don't recommend it for a lot of people, but I'm looking at the numbers and tickets. If this virtual thing uh, continues to stay, let's just say I'm able to charge uh, $20 a head and get 20 people in a room, that's $400 an hour. That's not bad, is it? I mean, l let's just say I, I can really push that limit to a high level and have something that's very different. I can probably move it even more, more so. So I was thinking there are entertainers who perform live for $100 an hour and you can fit in 20 and still keep it an intimate environment, $2,000. Even if you don't do this full time, imagine if you just did this on your weekend and did a show like on a Friday and Saturday evening, um, two shows Friday, th three shows Saturday. You can, you can really rake up some money if you knew the PR side and you knew how, how to do everything well. So that's my goal is to get visible enough that, you know, I could do this from anywhere in the world. Before I, w I wasn't thinking about online platforms because no one was used to it. No one actually did a Zoom show or a virtual show. But I feel like I can eventually get f flown out to Asia again and do shows on Zoom. Um, or I can fly in uh, Catalina or Hawaii. I've always wanted to work in some place like that. And then when someone offers me 10 or 25 grand, I'll fly back to California to do that one show. But at the level that I'm at, you know, thousand dollar shows aren't going to be uh, a problem. That's where I want to go. I want to do what David Blaine is doing, which is charging like hundreds of thousand dollars a show. Tell us what your experience has been so far in doing shows on Zoom, taking it virtual. Because thinking about magic, it's not the first thing that comes to mind that I'm going to go to a magic show on Zoom. Yeah. Well, this is a new medium. Most of the things that worked in real life do not work on Zoom. So 
I started from zero. I started thinking of this like I'm street performing again. I just tried stuff and new stuff. Every day I was putting in new things and I would scrap things. But I found a show that's solid enough that I think that this is going to be the framework around which I can do a show that no one else is doing. And I've seen every single magician that I can buy a ticket to. I've even snuck into shows and I've seen what's out there. Now I know what they're doing and I want to do something completely different. You're a very creative person. I can hear that when you talk about magic and your business. What kind of things have you had to do to adapt from doing magic in person to doing it virtually? You're learning every day and you're just continually, you're, you're reading books and looking at DVDs and you're just looking at other art forms. I don't want to steal from magicians. I already know what a lot of the magicians are doing. I steal from other art forms. I find out what other art forms are out there and I continue to push in those um, limits. And I had a couple of things that I could sh uh, show you later uh, once, once we get off. <laughs> it's kind of, it is like music, right? It's like a musician who is listening to other styles of music or traveling and listening to world music to expand their uh, horizons and then taking those influences and incorporating it into what they do. Now, a lot of magicians are cover bands. They play like other people's music. They can do the trick, but there's no surprise because you see everyone else do it. And an example is the cups and balls. To me, that's too long a trick. And anyone who does the cups and balls, I'm like, why are you doing it that same way? You never see David Blaine do a trick four or five times with a different variation. It's like asking someone to play the scales. You need to know how to play the scales in arpeggios, but you don't want someone to play the scales because if the trick is strong enough, you do it only once, they won't catch you. If you continue to do the same trick again and again, they're going to catch you. So an effect like a classic, uh, cups and balls or the linking rings, to me, unless done very differently, shouldn't be done at all because so many people have seen it and it, that surprise is no longer there. Sure, if you're doing your first 10 years in magic, it's okay to do that because you're probably charging a lot less. But once you're starting to perform for billionaires, they have seen Copperfield, they've seen all these top names. So you have to have your own personality and your own spin in things where they're still intrigued. In this time of COVID-19 and shelter at home, people in the corporate world who are working remotely, they're learning from the online solopreneurs trying to set up their uh, home studio because everyone's doing more Zoom calls. What does that adjustment look like for a magician? Um, for me, it's great because um, uh, I, I, my wife is a reviewer, so she reveals stuff online. So what you see right here, this microphone, it's, this is a review item, a lot of other things. So a lot of the, we were already prepared for this in some ways. We were pretty well transitioned. I had this backdrop for my live shows. So the only thing I did was set it up in my house. I pulled it out of my garage. Now for me, I don't have to take up or down this. I have four and a half hours worth of material. So my show's even stronger virtually than it was live. Because I have so many more options, it used to be a chore for me to do certain things that require a lot of setup. Now you can see things that I wasn't willing to do unless people paid me $5,000 to do. Now I can do that every day because it's all set up for me which is something that's one big advantage of zoom shows. And a lot of people don't have that vision where they realize, Oh, zoom shows aren't going to be here to stay. The reason why zoom shows are going to stay, there are five or 10 people who are killing it with zoom shows, M myself being one of them, but everyone else, I'm sure after this pandemic is over, they're going to go back to their regular shows. For me, I'm going to be charging a lot more, hopefully for my live shows, because I plan to really, milk this medium and really make the best out of this. So you're taking advantage of the medium. You're trying to see what things you can do, which is incorporating props and things that you might not have been able to bring with you to a private party or a show because you have it right there and you set up your, you set up your area perfectly so that you can do a lot of different tricks. You do think that 
you'll continue doing Zoom shows for a long time? It's not just a temporary thing? I hope to be doing this, but even if I don't uh, do a Zoom as much, I'm still going to demo. Everyone's used to, if, if prior to COVID, if I said, hey, can you do, jump on Zoom and can I show you a demo? People would probably say no because they didn't set this up. Now, if I tell any reasonable business person, hey, can you jump on Zoom for me? They're already familiar with it. With that, I know I can sell you because my closing rate is so high with Zoom. Before, it used to be talk back and forth and they'd watch a video. If I show you something right now, like that effect that I showed you before, plus the six other effects that I do to demo, they instantly will buy. They'll know that they're getting something different. For Zoom shows, is that a private party, a private event for like a family or friends, or is it corporate or both? Uh, in the beginning, it was a, uh, a lot of families, but now it's mainly corporate. I'll bring in family. Sometimes if it's take your kids to work day, my son will come along. I think we've performed for Nintendo, Twitch, and Google, uh, a congressman. All since the beginning of the pandemic, we've performed in Mexico, South Africa, uh, Singapore, Malaysia, um, Australia, the East Coast, uh, many parties for uh, East Coast, a lot of parties where they had dually based teams, where they had teams based in the... Bay Area and in India, G joining together, a lot of these guys haven't even met each other. Sometimes when they do meet, they would fly out to see each other, but now they're actually joining virtually. And that's becoming more of um, a great teaming building exercise because you can also invite clients. I tell people this, when you're throwing a party, you used to have to pay for food and drink. That's minimum if you're going cheap, 50 bucks a person. Now you can invite friends and clients and you're not paying for food the only thing you have to do is pay for entertainment so i think a lot of companies should use this as a good excuse to get together and have you know even spot I, in the beginning i had a lot of corporations saying oh i only have eight people or nine people i'm like price is still the same i just said invite your vip clients don't just make it about your team some people i say invite your family from malaysia or some other people. And it's amazing how many people can get together. We've had three and four generations get together watching the show. For me, I'm more like a sophisticated entertainer, but when I bring on my son who's juggling three and four and five balls and doing like his thing with Klaus the Mouse or some other thing, it's a full variety textured show where I can bring in my family getting to know my client's family. Well, magic appeals to everybody and multi-generational that's for sure what is your vision y you you alluded to being able to charge and it doesn't matter how many people there like is it by event is it by per head how do you put pricing together uh when i first started it was 300 500 600 that's when i was getting my bearings now it's 500 to 2500 uh it it's based on the number of people up to a certain point, and then it goes a lot higher. So a 500 would be the base point where I'm at right now. Very cool. Yeah, so it's it's very, uh, it's pretty flexible uh, starting from the $500 price point. It just depends on the number of people, how busy I am because I'm working constantly. I just did two shows prior to jumping on this podcast on certain days. My clients will actually change the date of their party just to have me. And that's talking about keeping your calendar filled. Uh, at one time I told a client, um, I knew I was going to get an event of between uh, two, uh, 1000, 1000 plus dollars. And I told the other client, I'm about to sign a contract. If you want something FedEx a check to me for five grand, it was Christmas. I already had four inquiries for that day. And one person said they were interested. That person immediately said, are you as good as a promo? I said, yes, I'm that busy. I can ask that. And he said, I'll FedEx a check. He FedEx five grand to me immediately to lock in his date and time. It, it's all about demand. And that's about the business side and the money side. It's you have to have enough demand to say no. I, I also have a lot of passive investments because every single company that has hired me, I've bought one share of stock minimum. Some companies I've bought way more just because I've been tracking them. And that also lets me know if the company is doing good, give them a call. If I give them a call, 
you know, they have a lot more money because their stock price is up and you know they're doing really well. So that gives me an indicator. I look at my stock portfolio and I'm tracking from, at one time, the men's warehouse was doing real well. Square was doing well. Um, Yahoo and Google were doing well. So um, it's just having a pulse on the economy that's not just in the magic side. Your client list is definitely a who's who of the Bay Area, Silicon Valley. There's Airbnb, Apple, Bank of America, Baidu, BitTorrent, BuzzFeed. And I know that you mentioned that you try to have one per letter of the alphabet and we can go on and on. How is it that you decided to invest in shares of every client? The mistake when I kept on going back to Google, I would see their stock price go up. I, you know, that Google's hired me 25 plus times. And I could have bought it right in the beginning because that's when they hired me, right in the beginning. I kept on watching that price go up and Amazon hired me. And when you see that go up, you're like, you want, and I've recently asked people for shares of stock and I've even gotten a little bit of equity in companies that have hired me over four times. But these are startups. This is a little bit of gamble, but it's still better than not having anything because there, a lot of times these startups don't want to spend a lot of money yet. Um, there's that thing that you might have read about in the news where Facebook offered shares to the person who drew the mural. But I think that's great PR for companies. So if you plant that seed, they might pick that up. And it's amazing. Go ahead and Google Facebook mural um, stock options and you'll find out about a guy who really made it big and cashed out big for that. And that's what I'm looking to do. I have a billionaire client who has me teach um, magic to their kids. Uh, hopefully I can do a little bit more and eventually pitch them on a venue because I'd love to have a magic castle in the Bay Area because I've performed at the Olympic Club. I've performed at California Club and so many other private clubs in the Bay Area. Um, you wouldn't believe there's at least 25 different country clubs just in the Bay Area that I've been at. And then beyond, I've done events in Germany, Shanghai, Las Vegas, Baltimore, Washington, D.C., and typically these are at restaurants or clubs. And now I want to have one of those in the Bay Area and um, I'm building up a team to execute on that. You definitely have big visions and you're executing on them. We can see that from your alphabetical client list. What I love about your buying shares of your customers is that while you love doing magic, at some point, I would imagine that like you can't do magic forever, but your investments in theory can make money while you're sleeping. Absolutely. I think that's what we all want to do. But what's interesting that I like doing is looking at the company culture. They're not giving me any inside information. I'm just asking the same a little bit deeper and asking certain questions. Uh, and that really makes all the difference. And then also trying these things out and going on their website. For example, when I was processing credit cards, in the beginning I was getting PayPal, right? But later on I was using Google Checkout. Then later on when Square came through, I was uh, using Square. And then when Visa hired me, I looked at Visa and I, would, I, wanna, I wanna be aligned with them. So even if I give them a small discount, which all companies ask, you know, sometimes they ask for something, I'd rather, be like, hey, I'm vested in your company. If you win, I win. What questions do you ask? Go ahead and ask that again. What questions in regards to? I think you said that you like to ask you like to ask them questions. You're not looking for insider information. And I was just curious what what type of questions do you ask your clients when you're when you're making connections with them? General questions and I ask about who their competitors are. So I can make the joke. Like when I do this trick with uh, Google, I say uh, I do this trick where Google is incorporated in, um, here's a good secret that I haven't really tipped off, but if you flip, you can make Google appear on your calculator upside down. So if, as long as you can get those words to appear on a calculator, you have a magic trick. So finding out about a company or, and their competitors, like when I drop a card, I can drop a card and I can say that's a Yahoo solution. And I can make fun of the competitors. But once I know who their competitors are, I can look back 
on their publicly public information, like look at what their PE is, look at what their balance sheet says, how much money they're making. Just look over everything that you should be looking over in a financial statement and ask yourselves those questions. When I first started, I knew that Yahoo was killing the yellow pages. When Google came, I already saw that Google would kill Yahoo just because it was directory versus search. And then when I saw Facebook come up, I realized that Facebook would be a place that people spent a lot of time. But at the same time, I, I realized it wasn't going to kill search. And also I knew the competitive advantages of studying their business models, studying YouTube and YouTube ads. And I bought ads. For example, I would buy ads in YouTube where if you hit skip ad, it was absolutely free. So when you're buying ads in something and you click and someone hits skip, I'm not paying for it, but I'm getting market share and impressions. Isn't that really valuable to get in front of people for free? So that's where I was at. I was thinking, how can I amplify this reach and how can I hack their, um, um, their bidding system? So like everyone here now said, hey, we're not going to advertise in Facebook. Well, I stopped for Facebook a while, but I, I actually ended up going back onto Facebook and uh, searching for event planners and globally, and I've been sending my ad. And right now it's really cheap on Facebook because it's uh, 12 cents per, I think, click right now for me because I'm doing very specific targeting. Uh, so it's just having your finger on that pulse. Yeah, it sounds like you're taking advantage because a lot of the event planners, there are no events happening and they're trying to pivot too. So you get a better price <laughs> on your ads well, delivered to them. I'm demoing for event planners and I'm telling event planners, hey, do you want a free demo? Do you want to show your VIP a client uh, a free VIP uh, effect? Once I demo once, everyone's going to buy because no one can think, oh, will this work? But if you show them five or 10 minutes of it, it's a no brainer. Right. And it comes down to their network, their connections that are valuable. Yeah, it's that free sample at Costco. A lot of times people say, don't do anything for free. You just have to know when to do it and how much to leave out so that they want the rest of it. Dan, I like to ask all the Inspired Money guests, how do you define success? Over time, it's different because you want to not stay still. And that's why I have so much success because I have to think about personal success and financial success and what's realistic because some things are so moonshot that it takes you 10 years, 20 years to get there. So I, I don't want to put all my hope in one thing, but I just wanted to check off everything. I have not worked for a company that starts with a J yet and one that starts with an X. Uh, I haven't worked for Xerox or Johnson and Johnson or anything big like that. So I'm still trying to finish that off. I'm trying to find it in investors, perhaps crowdfunding or otherwise. It'd be nicer just to have a billionaire throw some money away and say, hey, we're seeing, seeing that you're doing great things. We'd love for Asian entrepreneurs to be successful. That's just the dream thing. So you don't have to be accountable to shareholders or other people who are looking back to making money. Otherwise, you're just going to have to grind it through. And I'm creating my own own little war chest so that I can have a physical brick and mortar venue. When everyone's moving away from brick and mortar, that's where I'm strategizing to go in. Because you want to do everything opposite of what your competitors are doing. I, I, especially when you lead like that. If someone, everyone's charging a thousand, you want to be at the 10,000 mark. That, oh, that's at least the goal. That's what you tell yourself. That's what I tell myself so that I don't mind working the 12 and 14 hours. It's requiring me to push through these times. <laughs> Thank you, Dan. Thanks for sharing your inspiring story of chasing your passion in magic and really your insights as a business person as well. Can you tell the Inspired Money listener where to find out more about you and follow you? Yeah. I'm on Instagram at Dan Chan Magic. I'm also at danchanmagic.com. And I do have an Airbnb experience. Hopefully you can put that in the show notes where they can see me at a reasonable cost to see me entertain and do this new Zoom show, Magic and Mind Reading, um, on Airbnb experiences. I'll definitely put that in the show notes and encourage everyone to check it out. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thanks, Dan. So what was your favorite Inspired Money moment? Dan shared many valuable insights, from networking better at the office, 
to the power of walking away in negotiation. My favorite inspired money moment is his contrarian thinking. Did you catch it? He said you should be doing the opposite of what your competition is doing. If you truly want to differentiate what you do, this is a valuable tip. Okay, inspired money maker, let's connect on social media. Screenshot this episode with your smartphone and post it to Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, wherever you're hanging out. Don't forget to tag me. I'm inspiredmoney.fm on Instagram, Runny Mead Cap on Twitter, that's R U N N Y M E D E C A P, or Andy Wong, A N D Y W A N G 888 on LinkedIn. Use the hashtag Inspired Money. You can always email me at inspiredmoney.fm slash Andy. I'd love to hear from you and happy to give you a shout out here on the podcast. I'll even mail you an Inspired Money sticker or button. Inspired Money is edited by Christopher Wright of Wright Media. Thank you so much for joining me. If you haven't yet subscribed, please do it right now to ensure that you won't miss next week's episode. I'll see you then. The music you're listening to right now and all other music on today's show is by the amazing Jim Kimo West. Have an inspired week and do something that scares you because that's where the magic happens.